All right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is afternoon. In England, it's later in the afternoon. Um, welcome to week three of Doors Open Baltimore. Uh, the annual, this is now the eighth annual celebration of all things uh, uh, great in architecture and spaces in Baltimore. Uh, this is a virtual presentation. Uh, I am Rob Brennan, uh, past president of AIA Baltimore and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation, a member of the Doors Open Planning Committee and co-chair of the AIA Baltimore Historic Resources Committee. I'm also an architect. Uh, and I, I know two of the presenters uh, today from uh, my 12 years on the Landmarks Preservation Commission in Baltimore County. Um, First, thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Uh, your support enables us to organize programs like Doors Open Baltimore for free each year. And a big thank you to this year's Doors Open Baltimore sponsors and the Baltimore Architecture Foundation supporters. Uh, a few an announcements going forward. We have a month's worth of in-person and virtual Doors Open programs. Tomorrow evening, uh, join us for a virtual tour of the Peel Museum the oldest purpose-built museum in the United States. It's a beautiful building, it's uh, being renovated and uh, uh, everyone should be familiar with it and should go see it. Um, then on Friday, Mike Franch of the Baltimore City Historical Society will be presenting about Baltimore's vernacular churches. And on October 21st, we are partnering with the Baltimore City Historical Society on a book talk, A History Lover's Guide to Baltimore where we will be joined by co-authors Brennan Jensen, no relation, and Tom Chalky. Um, let's see, today um, we are joined by Carol Allen, Nancy Goldring, and Nancy Horst, presenting on the uh, history and development of East Towson, a uh, historic African-American community in Baltimore County, one of 44 uh, that have been documented. Uh, Carol Allen is uh, the creator of East Towson from Jim Crow to Black Lives Matter, uh, has served for over two decades as executive director of Historic Towson Incorporated. She is a past chair of the Baltimore County Landmarks Preservation Commission. With her rich experience as a historic preservationist, Carol accesses an extensive body of work to advocate for justice, equality, and equity. Uh, Nancy Goldring is the newly elected president of the Northeast Towson Improvement Association and granddaughter of longtime and highly esteemed leader of historic East Towson, the late Adelaide C.V. Bentley. Earlier this year, uh, Nancy learned of her family's ties to man manumitted slaves from the Hampton Plantation. Nancy speaks with us today from her life lived experience and a commitment to protect her community's unique thread in the fabric of American history. Nancy Horse served on the Baltimore County Landmarks Preservation Commission for 12 years, including two terms as vice chair. She is a longtime community volunteer. Nancy currently serves on the board of Historic Hampton Incorporated. She is the former executive director of the Towson Partnership headquartered at the Carver Community Center. Uh, if you have any questions, please add them uh, to the Q&A box and we'll take them at the uh, end of the presentation. Uh, so with that, let's get started. Carol Allen. Well, um, I just want to briefly introduce the talk um, and um, that I had originally started doing research for a pre presentation to a social club to better understand the Black Lives Matter movement. And I used Historic East Towson as its main focus. Um, but along the way, I made many discoveries about this amazing historic neighborhood that has been overlooked for its importance and value since it was founded. We are pleased to present its history, which includes how it got started and developed, its relationship with Hampton Plantation, Jim Crow, and how it shaped the community, backlash from the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and environmental racism. So we're gonna pack it in and be as brief as we can, but buckle up, it's at least 30 minutes and we look forward to your Q&A when we're done. So now what do I do about sharing the screen? You can hit that big green button on that taskbar, the share screen button. 
Okay. Uh, is it is it sharing? Not so. not yet. Do you do you see the share screen button on the on the taskbar down there? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. I see something that says share. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. Woo. I did it. All right. So uh, here we go. Okay. All right. Doors open. Historic East Towson. Okay. So the focus of this talk is on the architectural structures unique to Historic East Towson following reconstruction and largely as a function of the Jim Crow era. However, in as much as these forces shaped an unlikely sovereignty and self-sufficiency born out of the persistence of racism, the depth of connectedness and community in this now tiny African-American enclave uh, of six blocks was and continues to be the saving grace of the, this East Towson neighborhood. So the secret sauce of historic East Towson is not as readily discernible in our architecture as it is in each life and family that makes us one big knit, rich with history, worthy of preservation and protection generation after generation. And yet time and pressure soon reveals architecture's undeniable ability to reflect the evolution of culture, consciousness, and how we interpret the journey. In this picture, we see Bill Jones. And we have Bill Jones here because the University of Maryland College Park named its new athletic center, the Jones Hill House after Bill Jones and Daryl Hill, the first African-American football and men's basketball athletes to earn scholarships and break the color barrier in Atlantic Coast Conference sports. In the words of the esteemed Bill Jones, a trophy might break, a photo might fade, but a building is there for a lot of people to see. And uh, he goes on to say, I'm elated for everyone from the east side of Towson and my family, grandchildren, and my 96 year old mother who will be able to see this building with our names and what this building represents. But how did we get here? Where did it all begin? To tell the story of East Towson, we must go back to its early formation in 1703. Most of downtown Towson fits within two colonial land surveys. And those surveys were often done for persons who were hoping to develop plantations there. There was very little residential building in and around Towson and that was until the county government moved there in 1857. The history of East Towson dates from the purchase of one and a quarter acres of land by a freed slave, Daniel Harris and his wife, Anne in 1853. This is believed to be the first documented African-American land holding in Towson and is among the oldest such ethnic enclaves in Baltimore County. Manumitted slaves, men, women, and children once owned by Charles Ridgely eventually populated the neighborhood. Harris allowed the post-Civil War agency, the Freedmen's Bureau to build a school on his property sometime in the late 1860s, but development in East Towson didn't really take off until the late 1800s. The late, I'm sorry, the 1880 census showed 150 black people in Towson, few of them owned property and thus are not listed on, are not present on tax lists. Hardly any African-American had a business of his own. Most people were, uh, low were working low paid service jobs. East Towson developed after emancipation, about half of the black people were already free before uh, 
1861, before the uh, start of the American Civil War. None of the county's enslaved people were set free by the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation. Um, it was instead the 1864 state constitution that ended slavery in Maryland. The setting of the properties, their building styles, which you'll see later, and construction materials were guided by limited economic status of the residents and their desire to establish a neighborhood of their own without the assistance of white architects, builders, and craftsmen. By 1927, the community was 95% improved with single family dwellings, social buildings, a school, grocery stores, and religious structures. So what remains of that day? East Towson has two log houses. The first you see back here in, at the end of this house is called the Jacob House. It was actually a log cabin um, that, yes, thank you, Carol, uh, survived a fire. The rest of the house was destroyed. It started out as a one room, one room house for a family. It became the kitchen on a larger house. The house burned down and this log cabin house survived. Uh, it was moved from its original location on East Pennsylvania Avenue and it's now on the grounds of the Carver Colored High School, now the Carver Community Center and its logs are of chestnut wood. And these are some images of the interior of the space. It is available uh, to be for visit uh, by appointment. So if you ever feel like you'd like to take a look inside, give us a call. The second one is the Parker House. It was originally located on Jefferson Avenue and was moved to its current location on Fairmount. Uh, with the owner's consent, a small group of, uh, a small group including a building engineer, architect, and county historian and other interested persons went inside and with a rubber mallet, knocked a hole to expose the, uh, the chink, the logs and the chinking. So imagine a log house, just three blocks from busy York Road in the center of downtown Towson. The owner of the house today, um, actually the prior owner of the house was a developer and did the restoration and includes the ex exposed beams and the uh, current owner posted these pictures so that we might be able to show them to you today. Hampton and its history of slavery. East Towson was deliberately established in this location because of its close proximity to Hampton. And as you can see from this image, Hampton was a sprawling 25,000 acres of land extending from East Towson all the way over into White Marsh. The plantation was the most northern of all the traditional southern plantations and the hub of probably one of the largest industrial slave uh, concerns in the area. This is uh, the, the land mass, as you can see it coming into further development. And this is the famed Hampton Mansion. And uh, here we have a, an image from 1850 of a slave trade transaction, a man goes to market in all his finery. And you can see this is happening in the shadow of the Capitol. And uh, slaves are being traded. And there's a woman who's uh, chained to her children there. So this here you see two slave quarters and these were built uh, actually for the benefit of Mrs. Ridgely, Rebecca Dorsey, who wanted a decent view out of the window from the mansion. Here are some others. And this is uh, an image, am I not a man and a brother? It became an emblem from the abolition movement, both here and in England, 
possibly the taking of the knee, we kind of think, or Carol certainly did uh, by professional football players is related back to this image suggesting uh, that it's not a new movement, but the evolution of an older, more Sisyphean struggle. And finally, we have Nancy, da Nancy Davis. This is the winter edition 2020 from uh, an article that talks about the ethnographic study that was done by uh, the National Park Service on behalf of Hampton to try and see if they could locate residents or any descendants uh, from the slaves that were at Hampton. Uh, when I spoke with uh, Gregory Weidman and Cher Dr. Cheryl LaRoche, they said they were hoping to find five or six people and they found hundreds. And of course, East Towson is uh, inextricably tied to that lineage. So, um, now it's my turn. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Jim Crow, but before we get into Jim Crow, as I said at the beginning, this was my search about Black Lives Matter, and I was trying to understand it. So this is a picture that comes from the collection of the Library of Congress, and it's entitled, Tis a White Man's Government, from Harper's Weekly by the cartoonist Thomas Nast in 1868. And to deconstruct the picture, we have the man in the center that's holding a dagger that says the lost cause. And he has a belt on the CSA, Confederate States of America. And on one side, we have what is called a stereotypical um, Irishman holding a club that says a vote. And over here on the right is um, another man who's holding up a wad of money that says capital for votes. And all three of them are piled on top of this poor African-American soldier who is also sprawled on the American flag. And in the background, this African-American schools are in flames. And the picture says that somewhere you can see that they were had hung children. I don't see that in the picture either. It's so disturbing. I cannot bring myself to see it, or I, it's just not as clear to me. But this this is like um, four years uh, post Civil War or the freeing of the Maryland slaves. Um, so I. Uh, um, because Jim Crow had such an effect in East Towson, it's part of the talk. And um, so the question is, who is Jim Crow? Or ex to say it a little differently, who was Jim Crow? In 1828, a theater performer, Thomas Rice, based his character on Jim Crow, a folk trickster that had been popular among enslaved Black people. There was a traditional slave song called Jump Jim Crow. The character is dressed in rags and wears a battered hat and torn shoes. Rice applied, applied blackface makeup made of burnt cork to his face and hands and impersonated a very nimble and irreverently witty African-American field hand who sang, come listen all you gals and boys, I'm going to sing a little song. My name is Jim Crow. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. The Jim Crow laws were state and local laws that enforced racial segregation in the Southern United States from the late 19th and early 20th centuries by white democratic dominated state legislatures to disenfranchise and remove political and economic gains made by blacks during the reconstruction period. The Jim Crow laws were enforced until 1965. So just remember that they were enforced until then. Um, and you'll see in East Towson what happened after 1965. These laws mandated racial segregation in all public facilities in the states of the former CSA, Confederate States of America, and in some others, beginning in the late 1870s. They were upheld in 1896 in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, in which the US Supreme Court laid out its separate but equal legal doctrine for facilities for African-Americans. 
Moreover, public education had essentially been segregated since its establishment in most of the South after the Civil War. So here we have, you know, this shows, these are from the Library of Congress and some of them you see in various programs to do with um, African-Americans on television. Um, everybody's helping themselves to those wonderful pictures. And um, this one is not in Towson, but I, I have it here because it's um, exclusive colored theater. And one of the quotes we got from the newspaper about Bill Jones was that when he was growing up, there was segregation. And in order for him to go to the movies, he had to pass by the Towson Theater, which would not admit blacks, and get the bus to go downtown to the Boulevard Theater where African-Americans were able to see the movies. And then this is the um, Carver School, which um, if you wanted to graduate from Carver, you had your last year of school, you had to go into the city. The, the school only went through 11th grade. The county denied graduation in Baltimore County. There were three African-American high schools in Baltimore County for the 600 square miles of the, of the county. And this is just a picture of one of the class of students. This is Jefferson Avenue, and I call it Main Street of East Towson because so much of the community life took place here. So in the very top here on the right is probably the Parker House. It's not very clear here. Um, and this is St. James AUMP Church, which is about to have a very significant anniversary. It was founded in 1861. Um, and then next to it was the IOOF Social Hall, which unfortunately I was one of the commissioners that allowed it to be demolished because it was just caving in. It was so neglected. Um, and these are a couple of houses where people lived. And at the corner was Davidge's grocery store. There were two grocery stores, possibly a third in East House. And, and remember, these people were not welcome in white grocery stores. So over here in the far right, you see a little bit of the chain link fence and that's for the Carver School of which you've seen a couple of pictures. And it, another remarkable feature in this picture is the fact that there's only one car here. Um, and this, if you are driving in this area, it says Hillen Road and Jefferson, Hillen is now, this is the corner of Towson Town Boulevard in Jefferson. And this is the IOOF hall that doesn't um, stand anymore. It's a vacant lot. And this is the, the remaining one. Um, there were two social halls in East House and this is the Elks and it has this big addition in the front. Um, and this is the inside of that addition. It also has a fantastic outdoor space for get togethers. This is St. James AUMP Church. This was the um, minister's house or the pastor's house. He had originally started here, but wound up over here. And then in the back, you can see how there is some development. Um, the other church, and this is not a first generation building, um, is Mount Calvary AME Church. Um, besides Bill Jones, East Towson had its other share of distinguished um, people who live there. And because we're doing architecture today, I wanted to um, be sure you knew about Albert Castle, who only lived in East Towson for a year, and then his, he and his family moved into the city. His, um, I don't know what his mother did, but his father was what they call a cart driver. So he came from very um, humble background. It, somehow he got himself um, to Cornell, where he became um, graduated, put himself through college, uh, and became an architect. And from Cornell, he went to um, Tuskegee where he designed several buildings. And from Tuskegee, he went to Howard University. And eventually he ran the department or was the chair of the Department of Ar Architecture at Howard. In Baltimore, he designed um, the chapel and other buildings at Morgan. Um, and he also designed, if any of you remember Provident Hospital, that was his um, design. He had a couple of kids that went into architecture, and um, I think two of them 
continued his tradition at Morgan and designed some more buildings. This is his library building that he was most proud of um, at Howard University. Nancy Horst, it's your turn and you have to unmute yourself. Okay, here I am. All people want access, equal access to work, recreation, education, and safe neighborhoods close to schools, transportation, shopping, religious institutions, and medical care in homes they can afford. But communities without the financial resources or political clout can't compete with well-funded corporations, well-connected individuals, or government with easy access to loans, tax breaks, and other economic advantages. And since the people in these communities can't compete, nor can they easily relocate, they are forced to absorb the vicissitudes of environmental racism imposed by those who are successful in purchasing the land near where they live. The answer to the question of who has the rights to environmental protection and who bears the burden of waste and pollution is where environmental racism environmental racial inequity comes into play. As Towson grew and prospered, it became clear that East Towson was a very desirable place. As you can see from this map, uh, USGS quad over here, East Towson um, is right in the center of the community. Uh, it is um, everything to the York Road, if you can look at this map, I, I know it's small, but York Road is starting from the bottom, going straight up, and then it veers left, and Delaney Valley Road is the other arm of the Y. Uh, Joppa Road is the third road that comes um, off to the right and actually goes left too. Uh, and Joppa Road was the original road to Joppa Town uh, hundreds of years ago. It was the, the main north-south thoroughfare. Um, so this was very convenient for transportation, everything. But these Black people just lived there. And it was up to Baltimore County to see if they could take away some of their homes. Uh, so Baltimore County government, commercial interests, and private individuals actively sought to wrest control of many of the properties from their Black owners in many subtle or more obvious ways, such as putting noxious uses in the Little Village. I will highlight just a few of these indignities visited on East Towson. Uh, this early map shows the original plan for the Maryland and Pennsylvania Railroad uh, to be going near Joppa Road, but the route ended up going through part of East Towson, dividing the community north and south and forcing children to cross the tracks to go to school or play with their friends. You can see the Carver Colored School in the background here uh, near the railroad crossing and that loud train making one of 16 trips a day bel belching coal dust and smoke. Um, Here's another indignity. While the coming of Black and Decker Corporation at the end of Pennsylvania Avenue was a boon to the local economy, the continuous expansion of the plant and its vast parking lots over the years meant that houses in East Towson were lost and eventually the community's access to Joppa Road was completely cut off by this fence and everything else. So all along the far east side of the village is chain link fence or bars like this. Quite a view. Uh, although most of Baltimore County's inner suburbs were connected to sanitary sewers during the 1950s, the landlords who controlled many of East Towson's homes refused to pay for the connections to the sewers and residents who lived in rental housing and some who lived next to rent rental housing, so also couldn't get the hookup, uh, had to use outhouses until well into the 1970s. Um, another thing is when, here's, you know, go ahead. Uh, this, I'm gonna just contrast this. This is the other end of um, Pennsylvania Avenue in Southland, near Southland Hills. And this is what their housing looks like. Sure doesn't look the same, does it? And they're 
I would judge maybe a half mile apart, maybe. Um, when BGE needed to move its uh, York Road substation, um, at least eight families were forced out of their homes. See, these are some of the homes. Uh, here's where the substation is and the community ball field was paved over to accommodate this awful blight. Um, you can see in this, the next picture, please. Uh, the schematic, do we have the schematic with the no. cross? Oh, we already passed it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I wasn't quick enough. Uh, the, the, um, here they are. These were the eight houses that, um, were taken down. And then the BGE substation, which you see in the next picture, is where this red circle was. So basically they plopped it down right in the middle of the neighborhood. And if you live on Pennsylvania Avenue, Railroad Avenue, or Fairmount, this is the view that you have from uh, your back or front porch. Uh, BGE did agree to do some landscaping. What can I say? Uh, when the county wanted to move traffic around rather than through Towson, um, something as a transportation planner, I, I still can't understand, but that's another story. Uh, Towson, they built a bypass system by appropriating Susquehanna Avenue and part of Hill and Road to make Towson Town Boulevard. Fairmount Avenue was widened from, the, from Hill and Road for an east side expansion of the bypass, which effectively formed a, an impassable moat through the center of the community, again dividing at this time east to west. But I, I don't know, you can see some of these smaller houses, some of the big office buildings. This is looking north on Fairmount, um, if, you know, just to put there. As previously mentioned, Baltimore County refused to build schools to educate black children. A former barracks building served as one of the first schools in the community. Car Carver Colored School was one of three schools built in 1939 by the county to educate black students in grades eight through 11. Uh, the school was designed in a simplified international style with eight classrooms and administrative offices. Um, the last class graduated in 1958. Uh, over the past 20, the 30 years, the county has allowed more than 500 units of so-called affordable housing or Section 8 voucher units to ring East Towson like a noose. Since many of the buildings are 20 to 27 stories high, the original human scaled housing stock in the neighborhood that was torn down was replaced by towering buildings which blocked the sun and the sky. Today, East Towson is threatened by a four-story, 52-unit, Soviet-era-style affordable housing development whose architect should hang his head in shame, may I say. Um, it's called Red Maple Place. I have yet to find a maple tree on it, on the land, but that's the way it goes. It's to be built on the only remaining open space in the community. The two and a half acre lot is also at the headwaters of the West Branch of Herring Run, a stream with a long history of flooding. Baltimore County could take ownership of this parcel. Uh, I'm sure Nick Mangione would be happy to sell it to them. They could dedicate the forested area as a passive park. You can see where this is right here. It's the only green space there. Uh, and they could give East Towson its first county owned recreation area. Instead, the county recently purchased land for parks in uh, predominantly white communities like Lutherville. And in nearby Southland Hills at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue is the vacant Presbyterian home sited on 4.4 verdant acres, which is just perfect for affordable housing. But no one would dream of suggesting such a use in Lily White, West Towson. So um, this is, I think, Nancy Goldring is going to quick go through these, but in the interest of time, we don't want to linger on all the pictures. <laughs> okay, not a okay. problem. Not a problem. So I'll take you on a quick tour of what the community is like today. This is Harris Hill. Harris Hill is a condo and 
townhouse development that was built about 27 years ago. The, the county's uh, plan was to create housing that would allow African-American families who wanted to come back to Towson a place to come back to. However, it uh, sort of turned on its head by the end and only about five African-American families were um, sold houses to live here. Harris Hill ha is much more multicultural now than it was when it started. Its 53 units are now uh, probably represented by every corner of the world and still only about five African-American families live there. This is Railroad Avenue, the three houses uh, most prominent in the image are also houses built by the county and sold to, these are actually, these three do have residents who were historically from the community and their view is that lovely substation that you saw earlier. This is directly across the street from their homes. This is Hill and Road, and there's an older, older home, still belongs to an African-American family here. Um, this is Pennsylvania Avenue, the furthest end right next door. I live here where these uh, black cars are, and right next door is Black and & Decker. And um, actually, my grandmother worked at Black & Decker when I was a kid. She retired from there. And this is the house on the other side. So here is Lenox Avenue on the same street where you see the school, the Carver School. And the thing that sticks out to me given this talk is that the gray house here on my left anyway is uh, owned by Margaret Davidge. And Margaret Davidge is a descendant from Mr. Lynn Davidge who, who owned Mr. Lynn's store in the community for quite some time. My mother remembers it and uh, as does my, my grandmother did also. There are two houses on the street that were built in 1910 and remain in the families that built those homes in, in that time. Uh, there, the one in the center, the green one built in 1910. There's one on the very end of Lenox and Fairmont Avenue owned by the Mack family. It was actually the Mack family who had property where Black and Decker currently is. It was actually called Mackville because I think probably five, five different Mack families lived in homes on that property. This is Pennsylvania Avenue uh, on the other side of the bypass. Uh, just about every home has been taken over by a business of sorts. This, and on the other side is completely uh, commercial. The, the zoning line literally goes down the middle of the street. The image of, this image is of Evergreen, which is a townhouse community at the corner of Jefferson and Pennsylvania. And the thing that sticks out for me is that each time there's any kind of upgrade um, coming off of, York Road, we, our boundary shrinks. So our boundaries used to go out to Delaware Avenue and now they're at Jefferson. And of course, this particular uh, property is, is zoned, um, or not zoned, I don't think that's the right word. The zip code is 21204. Our zip code was changed many years ago to 21286 uh, for reasons that are only just beginning to be clear to me now. And there you can see how the buildings uh, tower over us in the distance. And still we prevail. This is a park that was dedicated to my grandmother's memory, actually to my grandmother. She was very much alive in 2017 when they dedicated it to her, which was which a, a neighbor space, which was really a great thing that she was alive and well to see that happen. This is the Mount Calvary AME church. So that's the church today. Um, I think there's that, that's their family life center. And that's a better picture of the family life center. And off to the, this is the interior. Yeah, that's the interior, the stained glass windows. 
Uh, I don't know who built the church, but they certainly did a fine job. It's always a lovely experience to be there. So the thing that I think we want to leave you with is that uh, these resilient communities exist probably nationwide. And this is our, our corner of the world where we have survived the slings and arrows of history and come out as best we can with the six blocks we have shining. Um, great people still live here. Great people have come from here like the esteemed Bill Jones. And we certainly thank you for being here today, Mr. Jones. And actually we're hoping we have enough time to ask you if you remember the ball field um, uh, where the substation used to be between Pennsylvania and Hillam Road. So thank you. That's it. So yeah, thank you. Uh, you wanna be the master of questions? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Um, Rob, Rob, thank you for giving the introduction. He's um, he's got to run to another meeting, so I'll, I'll take over for him. Um, so thank you, uh, Carol, Nancy, and Nancy, for this really enlightening presentation. We do have some questions uh, coming in. Uh, the first one uh, is from Lauren, who says that I grew up in Towson in the early '70s and was privileged to attend a church service at the AME Church by Hutzlers with my Girl Scout troop. Is that church still there, and is it still active? by Hustlers. That had to, maybe that was Mount Olive, because that's the closest church that would have been to Hustlers. It very, it is very much still active. It's 130 years old, plus years old. And my great grandfather, James Williams, started that church. And so it's still there. Uh, if it was close to Hustlers, then it was at the corner of York and Bosley. And my family still serves and worships there today. Yes. Wow, Nancy, you've got some real movers and shakers in your family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, here's another question. Um, yeah, yeah uh, has, has uh, Black & Decker sponsored any public programs or projects at all for the local community that are, that's directly impacted by their uh, station? Or it is completely removed from positive interaction with the community? Well, I can say that they were involved in the uh, purchase of the signs for the park that was dedicated to my grandmother. They did do a ceremony for her uh, not long after the dedication of the park in there. They have a kind of like African-American or, or diversity group as part of the organization. And that group certainly did honor my grandmother with a luncheon and most recently, we did a we uh, had a fundraising event called Jazz in the Rain Garden, and Black and Decker did allow us to use their parking lot for the benefit of that event. Other than that, any structured programs, any funding, anything like that, not that I know of, not in my time. Thanks. Um, and here's, here's another question. Uh, is there a sense of community pride or community solidarity in the neighborhood and in the Black community there? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is actually the only thing that's keeping us in place is the fact that we are a united community. We stand together against uh, the incursions that are the ball that's in play right now, which is, of course, Red Maple Place, as Nancy mentioned. And it has been that solidarity in the community, that sense of deep connectedness that still lives on, even though we've gone from 300 families back when the community was in its heyday. Like when Carol, when we say in 1927, it was 95% developed. My grandmother was born in 28 and loved Towson, didn't want to leave, even though the house she lived in the woman who owned it didn't want to sell to black people. For my family and families like ours, Towson wasn't just about the structure you lived in. That it was, it was, as my grandmother often called it, one big knit. It was one great big family. And that energy is still very much alive today. Yes. That's that's really great to hear. And you mentioned that that, uh, that development. And we had a question about that too, the, uh, the Red Maple um, development. Um, can you speak of, about the advocacy efforts that are currently underway and if people are interested in getting involved, how they can get involved? 
Oh, sure. Uh, so we had the, um, we fought it at the administrative law judge level and it went all the way into Baltimore County's Court of Appeals where we did, I guess we could use the term win, uh, a unanimous reversal by the judges to not build Red Maple Place. The developer Homes for America has appealed that decision to the circuit court um, for reasons we cannot begin to uh, understand, uh, when, especially when you consider the way the decision reads. We are continuing by virtue of events, not to just like this one. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with doors open. We are working with the Sierra Club. We're working with Indivisible Towson. We're working with Blue Water Baltimore, the Towson, a Green Towson Alliance, uh, Preservation Alliance of Baltimore County. Lots of organizations have partnered with us. Kathy Forbes, our delegate, um, Chris West, are all saying this is not a good project for our community. And so we still say that it means something to continue to write to John Olszewski, who still, as we understand it, has uh, some, I don't know how much, but some leverage, some power to turn this thing around. But we are committed to maintaining the community. I went to, I went to Towson Elementary School. And trust me, that was 50 years ago. And, and I sometimes would go over to Towson Elementary School today, maybe sit, get some coffee and a couple of cookies and just hang out in a quiet space. Well, the only thing that's changed is that Towson Elementary is now the Bicota Center. Everything that was there when I was a kid is still there and intact today. The only difference is that there is a, uh, what do you call that thing? There's a Royal Farm at the bottom of uh, West Joppa Road and there's Blakehurst which is the, probably the creme de la creme of senior living in, the, in all of Maryland, I believe. So aside, so that, it was actually being there on that street, on, you know, set, I think it's Center Street, a, across the street from my elementary school that helped me to understand that it was not unreasonable for us to want or expect that our community would remain intact. Uh, thank you. And we're running out of time here. So um, like any any last words, uh, Carol, Nancy? Well, well, I did want to point out that uh, Mr. Billy Jones is here and um, we'd love to see him. <laughs> Mr. Jones from my brother-in-law, Bob Strope. I don't know if you remember him at Maryland, but uh, uh, anyhow, he wanted to say hello. And um, I noticed that you said that you do in fact remember the old ball fields and the events hosted mm -hmm. there. Thank you for that validation. I can't tell you how many hours I have spent trying to find, trying to run it down and, and uh, it, it ha has proven futile. So thank you very much. I feel very happy about that and I'm glad to meet you vicariously. Well, I just want to say about Red Maple Place that it's the same thing as building a Walmart next to a Civil War battlefield. It's just so incompatible and um, inappropriate. Wrong. And if anybody can catch the attention of Johnny Oshevsky, please do <laughs> for us. <laughs> and thank you so much for inviting us to talk. Um, come visit in East Towson. It's a nice place to stroll around and see um, for yourselves what um, what what still stands. Um, it's quite a pleasant place to be. And there is, I will add, uh, Carol and has and Nancy have worked up a tour and I would think, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, Carol, sorry, but uh, I would think if there was a, a decent sized group, they would be happy to repeat that tour and take you around. It's yes, really and we had a self-guided walking tour brochure that's under construction. Um, the yeah. copy's written, the layout isn't done, so. I, I worked in the community for six years when I was with the Towson Partnership and that I, that's how I really got to know uh, the people. I mean, I knew Miss Adelaide for many years before that, but I really got to know the people there and how really wonderful and friendly they are. 
Oh, great. And yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch with you about organizing a, an in-person tour at some time. I think that would be I, a really nice program. I did leave my, uh, I did leave the community's email address for people who'd like to reach out about uh, tours. That's certainly an option. And again, th thank you for the opportunity. It's been terrific for us. And, and thank you. And um, for those of you who are in, in, in the audience, if you're interested in more Doors Open programs, you can go to www.doorsopenbaltimore.org to see um, the remaining programs we have throughout the month of October. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.